good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And today we are very honoured and proud to have with us the President of Estonia, Kirsty Kapolaid. So thank you, Madam President, for joining us. Um, the President of Estonia is visiting El Cano and visiting Madrid today to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the bilateral relationship between Spain and Estonia. And she's also doing this um, on International Women's Day. So um, congratulations and thank you very much for having made time for us. I'm just going to ask you a couple of very quick questions. First of all, um, Spain, like Estonia, has uh, suffered the impact of the pandemic. Um, as you know, it's had a brutal economic effect on, on, on the Spanish economy um, with uh, minus 12% GDP um, uh, impact on, on, on Spanish economic activity. Um, what lessons have you learnt as a leader, as a national leader and as a European leader from the pandemic? We have learned in Estonia that all our uh, uh, hard 30 years of work on keeping our fiscal balances now really pays off. And also our uh, difficult um, work to achieve uh, euro in the last financial crisis, where we basically balanced the budgets in the most difficult moment when, I mean, economy was in a free fall. But we realized that with this free fall, inflation is staying because we were converging towards the union uh, in salaries, in costs and everything. And we realized that this crisis here is a unique opportunity to, I mean, have low inflation. We had no debt levels, which would have kept us out from the euro area. And of course, our currency had no fluctuations against the euro. We were using a currency board mechanism. So we realized that there is a once only opportunity and we managed to pull through. And now in this crisis, we are actually reaping the benefits of them both. I mean, we have first time ever been able to let the automatic stabilizers to run. And this has limited the economic damage done to Estonia in last year only to about 3% of the GDP. And this means we can now act in solidarity with Spain and other countries who have suffered more because Estonian predicted proportion of the European help to overcome the crisis was supposed to be about the billion. It will now be much, much less. The rest of the money goes to those who have suffered more. Despite the fact that GDP per capita in Estonia is still only about 80% of the EU average or was before the crisis, we will see where we come out after this. But we have seen that our hard work has actually given us the room for manoeuvre this time. And many decisions we, take, we have taken previously at the theoretical basis that one day we might need all this fiscal prudence for the situation when it's really bad, have now been proven right. And uh, I hope we understand this as a nation and as an example. Earlier you were stressing quite rightly that we're all in this together. Um, so my question really is, do you think the EU will really be able to make virtue out of necessity? In other words, to really, for example, countries like Spain and Italy, which have been particularly badly hurt, to really sort of leapfrog into the 21st century thanks to uh, the funds that, that are going to be available in areas such as the greening of the economy and the digitalization of the economy. I think Europe is doing what it can to kindly prod us towards structural reform as well, because uh, the, uh, the European budget and also the Recovery and Resilience Fund, they have to be dedicated to climate change, the whole budget every fourth euro. In the Recovery and Resilience Fund, 37%, 20% to digital development. This is the kind prodding which the Union can do on our own behalf because we have directed commission to do so. It's a council decision after all how, how we spend these resources. So the rest is in the hand of uh, in the hands of the national governments and and European Union cannot, I mean, reform any country. European Union cannot create egalitarian education systems or good healthcare systems which is easily accessible to everybody. This job is a national job and I, I really appreciate this character of our union, that it is an enabler, not a dictator who tells us how to move. On the other hand, all what European Union is trying to achieve is our own common product. I mean, we have in the Council decided that we want to do the green turn. And it's easy to probably validate our, our objective to our citizens by explaining that also this pandemic shows that, I mean, we are making ecosystems poorer than they need to be, that we are a burden to this, I mean, earth. And, and maybe this is the time when really not only the young generation, which I think has understood much better, but also our own generation realizes that, I mean, we are close to the point of no return to ruin our environment and we have to act quickly. Also, 
a year ago, where I, when I went somewhere and said at least one third of the jobs in our countries nowadays is geographically neutral. So in principle, we should adjust our industrial area tax and serve models in social market economies to the new reality that an Estonian may work in Spain, live uh, in Portugal and, and, and anyway travel freely globally. And to make things worse, they could even work in Fiji or Vanuatu people can work in Spain or in Estonia. We need to learn to cater for these people as well by making sure that, first of all, the services market are open, digital markets are open, including data accesses, and to make sure that these people will get the benefits which they have also created for the society, and to make sure that if there are many people from, let's say, less developed nations working in our services market from distance, we somehow share the social benefits with these countries. We are still firmly sitting in our industrial area tax and serve model. We should totally accept that our people will leave this model unless we adjust this model. And this is a lesson I believe we still have to draw from, from these pandemics. But the first step has been taken. Each and every country has seen that about one third of the jobs are indeed geographically neutral because they are being done from homes nowadays. As an Estonian leader and as president, um, <clears throat> which is a very interesting position to be in because you have, although you are very busy, you also have the time to look ahead and to reflect about the, where your society is going and where Europe is going. Um, so Estonia is, is, in, is in quite a strong economic position, certainly by comparison with, with some other EU member states. But what are your major concerns on the horizon? You know, tell us a little about what you know, in, in structural terms, in terms of long, longer t term tendencies that you have seen developing uh, during your years in office, what, what keeps you awake at night? Uh, I would still say climate, technological transformation and social justice in our systems. And we were talking lengthily about it also in our previous podcast, so I wouldn't repeat it all here. But let's take technology uh, and uh, see what impact technology has. And let's take, well, security beside technology. The problem here is that none of our old risks have been uh, disappeared because, I mean, there are new risks related to technology. I mean, the conventional risks are still there. It's not like you don't have to worry about petrol supplies if electricity is available. And, and, and in technology, in, in the free world, we see that, uh, not like in 20th century, when if something was created, something really innovative, then probably you had public money and public knowledge behind it. In nowadays world, in artificial intelligence domain, for example, in free world, it all happens in private sector. So we find ourselves in the situation where we need to accommodate what has been developed in private sector and realize its potential, for example, in our defense capabilities. And meanwhile, we have global competitors who don't have this problem because, I mean, they are still controlling all technology development in their country and in addition have no worries about, let's say, data protection, which means that their artificial intelligence is learning quicker than ours. And this is sometimes keeping me awake because I realize that, I mean, the technology is, is developing exponentially and our knowledge, even if, I mean, we tried ourselves in Munich Security Conference together with Ambassador Ishinga to raise awareness of the technologies in, in defense. I mean, the knowledge is growing linearly at the best but technology is exponentially growing. So a difference of understanding and what is the real world is actually growing. And this applies not only to, I mean, straightforward conventional military developments, but also to the hybrid risks. If you can buy hundreds of thousands of, uh, of influences on social media for a few hundreds of dollars, I mean, you have to understand that this creates bubbles in your societies. And we have to decide how we handle it. Normally we say there is propaganda, we don't do anti-propaganda because in principle they are the same. We try to explain facts to our people. I am not sure where we should go, but my question is, can we stick to this principle when we know that adversaries are using these, I mean, hybrid electronic capabilities to, I mean, influence the minds of our people? I don't know what is the answer. But I know we are not discussing enough of this. So indeed, I see that technology, while for me it's a great enabler, a great equalizer in the society. For example, I mean, if your tax declaration is electronic, SME can do it as easily as a big company. If it's not, big ones have advantages. So there is all the good benefits, but there are also the risks. And we should actually look at both sides 
and more openly, more understanding, understandingly, try to talk to people who actually are developing these technologies. Not from the point of power, but from humbly accepting that in the free world they know more than we do. One final question, very briefly. Um, Spain is the fourth largest EU economy. Uh, it's been an active participant in NATO's uh, Baltic Air Police mission. Um, wh what could the two countries do better? Uh, wh where would you like to see the relationship going or, or strengthening in the future? In defence, specifically. Uh, I believe that in Europe, in common, we can develop together the technological aspects of, uh, of modern warfare. And this does not demand, I mean, big behemoths. It, it demands smart and quick operators. And, and I believe Estonia understands these technological elements. And, and you, as a, as a middle size, I mean, military market, we, we can work together in this to make sure that uh, we all have a share in the space and also that we create the free market for, for defense equipment in Europe. Because right now we see that as soon as we only talk about 2% prices rise, I want to have a more open market also in that. And also these technologies should benefit our civil societies. We can work on this, for example, together. Excellent. Well, on that note, Madam President, thank you so much. I wish you a very fruitful visit here in Spain. It's been an honour and a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you.